the Christ life. Sometimes I get to thinking about what audacity do we keep talking about this thing. And uh, it has become so common to me and I guess to Robbie also that we just don't think any other way. And yet I realize that some people have different ways of thinking about the things of the Lord. But there's no doubt about it. If you think about the things of the Lord, you have to have a starting point. Or else there's just no... There's no growth and there's no uh, uh, love manifested for God. I guess those are the two things that, uh, that are most important to Christians, the, the, the issue of growth and the issue of our love for God. I don't know how you can separate the two. They sort of just kind of work together. But a Christian that doesn't want to grow up in the Lord hasn't fallen in love with the Lord yet. And anybody who really falls in love with God, now I don't mean they don't love God. You have to understand my language here, that uh, everybody can say, well, I love God. They love God uh, when they're in trouble. They love God when they pray. They love God when they bless the food. Uh, they love God when they go to church or love God and they give an offering. But uh, as I say in it, they're not in love with God. Because you can love God a thousand and one ways and not really be in love with him to where he's a controlling force in your life. So we are used to going to places where they say, everybody that loves the Lord, raise your hand. Everybody that loves the Lord, say amen. Everybody will say it because everybody loves the Lord. I think people that don't uh, even claim salvation love the Lord. I think uh, people who, uh, if they're not an atheist, they, they love God. But that doesn't mean they're in love with him because to be in love with him means that a deep commitment has been made to him. So the two important things about believers who are going on with God, one of them is they have a desire to grow in the Lord and the other is they're in love with God. They're in love with him. They don't just love him when they have need and pray and do something for him, but they are in love with him. And that means there's never a separation between them and him. So that's really what makes the Christ life so very important that we've genuinely fallen in love with the Lord. Not the Lord out there somewhere, but the very Christ that is within us. I was talking to a man uh, this past week who, who said to me that the, the Christ life message is, is, is so deep and is so abiding on people that there are very few people that want to go that deep in the Lord. Uh, that it just puts a lot of, uh, of uh, restraint on them to do this and to do that in order to make it work. And time he got through talking, I felt a little badly that this man had heard things that I had to say but had not come up with what I think is the message. And then I thought, well, maybe that's my fault. Maybe I haven't laid it out to him enough or well enough. But the Christ life is the greatest freedom a human being will ever have. It's absolute freedom. It, it is not putting us in bondage. It is giving us freedom. And after I listened to this uh, dear believer talk for a while, I realized something very important. That the hardest thing in the world for a human being to come to is freedom. And I thought about... Uh, just human beings in general, men who want businesses to work real hard, uh, become bound by that business. They have no freedom. And to, to, uh, to come to a freedom uh, means that they have to give up or stop some parts of the business. I remember one time I was counseling a man who was about to lose his wife and family. He was, he was in my church, in fact, and in the course of the conversation, I said, well, look, you're just, you're working too hard, you're going day and night, and, and uh, he interrupted me and said, but I'm doing all this for my family. Uh, he was never home, uh, he never took care of his uh, parental responsibilities or fatherly responsibilities, and finally, after a few moments, he looked at me when he saw the direction I was going, that I was going to do my best to cut down his outside work so that he could spend a little time with his family and home, that that was really more important. He looked at me and he said, Brother, I can't do that. He said, God gave me this business and he expects me to take care of it. 
So I realized something from that, that he didn't really want the freedom of doing what it was he was supposed to do. He had rather be bound by the bondage that he was in. That's the way believers are. Most believers had rather be bound by their bondage than to be free in Christ. When we talk about freedom, we're not talking about people who get so free and loose that they can just live anyway and do anything they want to, because that isn't where freedom is. Freedom is when Christ is your life. The life is in the Son, John said. And when you get a hold of that and see that the life is in the Son, that's what fulfills you and makes you what you're supposed to be. Now you gotta, you got to understand that. Freedom is you becoming what God created you to be. Now, I'll say it again. Most human beings never become what it is God created them to be because they are, they are uh, misapplying themselves, uh, doing something other than what actually fits their very creation, what God created them to be. Uh, God uh, uh, created every one of us to manifest Christ by that creation, which means that every creation is different. No two of us alike. I believe by, by uh, the study in Romans 12 that, that there are seven different categories of God's creation. And uh, we need to talk about that at another time. But every one of us fall into one of those seven categories of God's creation. But no two of us are alike, even in the same category. We're all different. But the only way we ever fit that category or fall into the perfection of the creation of God is when Christ fulfills us. Colossians says that. Christ is our fullness. Christ is our completeness. Well, getting a hold of that idea and living it for a period of time brings you to a freedom to be who you are. To be who you are. Not to do what you please, because to do what you please may still have the strains of the old way of thinking working in you. You see, long before you were saved, Satan used your mind. He misused you. And he gave you all sorts of thoughts and ideas. They worked through you. And when you got saved, there was no change in your mind. That's where sanctification's taking place. That's where you're growing up in the Lord is in your mind, in your soulish part. And some of those old ideas are still there. But Christ in you is not going to use them. They're not going to fit him. It's like Saul's armor. He's not going to take hold of these old ideas that are in your mind. So if you love the Lord and you're going to grow in the Lord, you have to begin this change in your mind. Now, the Apostle Paul had a word for that in, in, uh, back in Romans uh, 12, I believe it is. He's, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Continue not to be taken up with the things of the world, the outer things that have ruled you up until you were rebirthed, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the whole key to what it is God is doing is finally hinged on you being willing to let Christ take over that mind of yours. Now, when the Christ in you is able to move through your mind, that's when you begin to fulfill your creation, what you were created to be. You see, I can guarantee you, you'll be absolutely healthy and happy if Christ fulfills your creation. I'll promise you that you will come to a joy and a peace that you've never known when Christ fulfills your creation. That doesn't mean that you be doing nothing, that you'll just sit there and all of a sudden come to rest and peace. It's, it's ironical when I talk about rest and peace, most people think about nothing. They think about a, a bug floating on a log down the stream or a leaf floating down the water and they just think there's nothing. It's the very opposite. Once you fulfill your creation by Christ in you, you may be a raging dynamo. There may be some of you sitting in this room that have, that have always been nobodies, but when Christ fulfills you, you become, as it were, a somebody because your whole personality may change. There may be some of you that's been raging dynamos that become uh, very introvertish because all of a sudden you realize, I am who I am and I have to do nothing to be that. See, you will have fulfilled what God created you to be. Some of you are not speakers, and suddenly you become speakers. 
Actually, we've seen this through the years, but we had no technical message for it. For instance, I've seen through the years that when people were converted, the most backward of people uh, became the most powerful witnesses for Christ, and the most limited of speakers became preachers, and, and the folks that couldn't carry a tune became singers. Uh, what happened? By Christ in them, by them being born again, their true self began to come forth. Yourself is incomplete without Christ, and the Christ that is in you is what makes the difference. Well, now I want to tell you something. There's multitudes of people who don't want that freedom to be who they are. They don't want it. And that's what you come up against in religion with your own friends and loved ones and people within the church. They don't really want that freedom. They, had pref they prefer a stereotyping. A lot of, a big percentage of people prefer to be stereotyped. They want to all be set in a row and want to all be singing the same songs, praying the praying, same prayer, believing the same things and saying, I'm Baptist or I'm charismatic or I'm Catholic. They want to be that way. They, they, want, to, they want to be that way because they don't understand what it takes to become who they are, that Christ fulfills them. So a great percentage of people don't want this freedom that we have. I was thinking about this the other day, and I, and I thought a lot of people don't want this freedom because they can't stand it. They can't stand this freedom because they would have to give up the security that now makes them what they are. Now, a lot of people don't want to give up that security. They don't want to exchange what it is they are to become what they can be for God's glory. Because it's very painful to lose the security of what you think you are. Well, this kind of talk makes you think, well, that's real radical. I don't want to get mixed up in anything like that. But, but the facts are the Holy Spirit's dealing with you is constantly moving you and shoving you in that direction to become a Christ person. Where Christ operates through your person to the effect of God's creation, the way God made you to be. So the real facts are, if you want to grow and you fall in love with God, then the whole of what God's going to do for you is summed up in you becoming what God created you to be. And that's fulfilled only by Christ in you. You say, how do I know that's working? The more you take on the knowledge of Christ, the more you grow in the knowledge of the Christ that's in you, the more spontaneous becomes your living of him. But let me put that another way. The more you know Christ who is in you, the more he will come forth as you spontaneously. It'll be spontaneous. You won't have to put your finger on it. You won't have to have five things you got to do every day to make it work. You won't have to be praying special prayers for it to work. The more your mind is renewed, the more Christ will come through you like you are, and it'll be spontaneous. Spontaneous. Well, now, I want you to think on that for a moment. When you were in sin, you were a spontaneous sinner. You never tried to be a sinner. You never tried as a sinner to do bad. It was never in your will that I'm going to be the worst person I can. I'm sure some people say a thing like that, but that's not the way average people live. Average sinners don't try to be bad and try to be ungodly. They just are. When I say they just are, what is that? That's spontaneous living. That's, they just live in what they are. Well, the more you take on the knowledge of Christ, the Christ that is in you, the more spontaneous is going to be your reaction to him. See, right now we're mostly in an era where, oh, God, I want to be just like Jesus. We read the scriptures and it says to do something. And we say, oh, God, I want to do that. I really need to do that. And we make a mistake somewhere and we say, oh, God, I'm a big failure. I just can't put it all together. You see, we haven't reached this spontaneous living as Christians as we were sinners. We never thought about being sinners, but we're constantly thinking about being good Christians. See? That means that our minds have not caught up with our spirit. 
Well, never will your soul catch up with your spirit. And that's why the writer of Hebrews said that the word of God will separate soul and spirit. Because your soul is always running to catch up with your spirit. That's the mind being renewed. The mind is always in the process of being renewed. Well, now you've heard these things from me many times before. But I especially wanted to talk to you while I was on this subject about how it is that a great percentage of people cannot stand freedom. They cannot stand the freedom to be who they are. They had rather be uh, denominationalized, categorical, eyes they had rather become something that everybody else is to kind of hide behind it rather than to become full and free individuals to be who God created them to be so don't get upset or greatly concerned when you see good people born again people who don't want to make any changes who don't want to go on with God who are not interested in what you have to say until they get hungry to know God they're going to be like that and until they get tired of the bondage and the law that they're under, they're not going to come to spontaneous living. But that's where we're headed, and that's the joy that we're in. But now, what I want to talk to you about on this subject is this Christ that is within us. You see, each one of us have a different idea about Jesus Christ. From little children, we were raised to think about Jesus Christ. We started out probably as little children. We were in a fundamental church singing, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And so we had some kind of a fuzzy notion that Jesus came into our heart. And we sang that. And somebody said, well, have you accepted Jesus in your heart? Yes, I accepted you. But didn't have the slightest idea about what that meant. See, sad to say, multitudes of believers grow up go into 20 years, 30 years, 40 years in the church, and they're still singing, Jesus, come into my heart, and don't have the slightest idea what that means. Now, did he literally come into your heart? We know what a heart is. A heart is the valve function that pumps the blood and that keeps us alive. Is that the heart he came into? That's the only heart we know anything about. That's really not the heart. That's not the heart that we're talking about when we sing Jesus come into our heart. We're talking about that part of our being which is, is in our soulish part called emotions. Oh, it don't sound so good when we put it like that. Did we say Jesus come into our emotions? Because the heart is a function of the emotions. The heart is the life of the physical, but the heart is not the life of the believer. Because there... We turn to spirit, spirit. We become spirit beings when born again in Christ. Our spirit is our life. So you see, we started out not really knowing what Jesus was going to do when he came into us. We had no understanding of this. Well, then a lot of us went along a little while with this, and somebody said, well, you really need power. You don't really, uh, truly, we did need something. We needed power, we need, and when we heard the message of the Holy Spirit, we wanted it because we didn't really understand about how Jesus came into our heart or how we got saved, and certainly we didn't understand what it meant to be born again because nobody ever explained that to us, that we were actually birthed into being another person by the Christ who was put in us. We didn't get that message at all. And so we accepted the Holy Spirit, and that, that was good. That, that carried us for a long time. And still carries us because you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Scripture uh, doesn't be around the bush on that. The more you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to know Christ and, and uh, exercise and express the Christ that is in you. But you see, we still didn't know. We still didn't know how Jesus came into us. How does Jesus come into a human being? Well, sometimes uh, you listen to me and I, I express it by John 3.16. For a loving father, so in the ultimate state of love, took his own sperm and put it in a believing sinner and made him a son. For that sperm, that sperm of God, that ultimate act of God was Christ, Christ in us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to sinners, that whosoever believeth not perish but have everlasting life. I said it like that. It's come to me in the last few days that a, a deeper 
trench needs to be dwelt for this idea to flow in. And that's really what I want to talk to you about tonight. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to do a lot of the teaching because about all I can do is lay out some, some uh, truths and some scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit to deal with you on it. But I want to talk to you about Jesus who comes into us. Just who is this Christ who comes into us? Because the mind gets bogged down by the fact of whatever we know about Jesus Christ. Probably everybody sitting in this room knows Jesus Christ as a vibrant doer. You know a time when you couldn't put it together and he performed a miracle and brought it all together. You know a time when you were maybe sick or a loved one was sick unto death and Jesus performed a miracle of healing. You know of occasion where you saw a great miracle. I dare say that's the main way you think of Christ. And so when I say Christ has come to live in us, God's gift in us, Christ in us is our hope of glory, your mind immediately reverts to whatever it is you know about Jesus as a doer, something he did. It has to. Or you think, well, I can remember the night I got saved. Jesus came into my heart and I felt so good. I cried and, and I, I had joy and so forth. So you think of Christ in a doing state when we talk about Christ coming into us. You either think of it that way or you don't think of it as a tangibility at all. You think of it as just sort of a fuzzy spirit thing. Well, I accept that Jesus is my Savior, and I believe he died for me on the cross, but I have no conception that he came into me, that Christ is in me, my hope of glory, that I was baptized into Christ or Christ in me. So you see, it's either one or the other. It's either that the idea you have in your mind about Jesus the doer or no idea at all about him coming into you constitutes your salvation. Well, you can see how when I start bringing this message that has a different language, we, we say different words, I think the words that I say to you are much more closely to the scriptures than any you've heard before. But we don't take it that way because we've never seen those scriptures like that before. And so I come talking to you about something we don't really understand. Am I actually saying that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes into every one of us by the seed, the divine seed God puts into us? Is it actually Christ, the Son of God, who comes into us? Now, you have to think through that, and only the Holy Spirit can help you to have any feeling or concept about what happens to you at that moment. I have never, before I, I begin to see the Christ life, had any feeling even for that. I can remember back years ago, I'd be preaching on the Holy Spirit, and I'd shout, the Holy Spirit is a person, and that person is in you, ready to act and do great and mighty work. I had the Holy Spirit fixed as a person, but not the slightest idea about how it worked as a person. So now I'm talking about Christ. Christ in you, you in Christ, are to God a oneness. You become one. How does that happen? Was it literally Christ? Is it a figment of the imagination? Is it just some words out of the Bible? Is there any literality to it? Is there any truth in it that actually Christ is in you? Now, to take this on further, let's say that we believe God has placed his dear son in us. Let's use Mary of Nazareth as an illustration of how God puts his son in another person where God himself cohabitates with that person, puts his seed, and creates Christ in another person as it was with Mary. Let's say he did that. What is the Christ that is put into that person? What or who is that Christ? You say, God only has one son. But now we have to reason that as God puts that one son in a human being, that one son who is co-equal with God must limit himself to be able to operate in that human being. 
Now this brings us to the very subject we want to talk about this evening. This subject has a name. And the name of this subject is a word that's taken from a Greek word, kinuo, which is a term we make in English, kenosis. Kenosis. This word is found in several different places in the scripture. Let me give it to you before I go to the prime text. In Romans uh, 4 and 14, the word means to empty out, to drain. It means to create a void. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 17, it is to make of non-effect. In uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and 3, it means to be in vain. And now to our text. In Philippians 2 and 7, it says to make of no reputation or to empty himself. So now I want you to turn with me to Philippians, second chapter, beginning to read at the fifth verse. In Philippians, second chapter, at verse five, we begin to read, let or allow this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, how many times have you read that verse? Did you know what was behind this verse? This verse says, let the mind of self-emptying be in you the same as was in Jesus Christ. Now, it is a shame that we didn't attach this verse to all of our teaching on crucified living. Like Galatians 2.20, our supposed Christ's life golden text of the Bible, says, I am crucified with Christ. What does that mean? That means that I have entered a kenosis with Christ. What is kenosis? I have emptied out. I have created a void. I have drained myself. My thinking has so radically changed that the very mind that was in Christ is in me. Actually, that's what it takes for a Christian to be a Christian. But you see, we're a long way from that in our understanding. We don't get that, that gospel that deep, let's say, that goes down the in that deep trench that I'm, I want to dig a trench for a deeper flow tonight, not a, not a trench to bury myself in, but one with a deeper flow. And so this, this verse translates, allow the same mind to be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, which is a self-emptying mind. See, a self-emptying mind. Now, let's read on. Here's what was in his mind. Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now you can see some very popular verses here that we have long claimed in, at various stages of our growth, but these verses are attached to this word and term, kenosis. That's really what they're attached to. Now, I want us to look uh, as close as we possibly can at uh, some of the wording here, and then we're going to go into what detail the Spirit gives us. Notice in verse 7, it says, He made himself. He made himself. Now, how did he make himself? He fixed a thing in his mind. Lots of times folks say, where do you get this idea we fix a thing in our mind? I get it right from this verse. He made himself think a certain way. He made his mind a certain way. Now, the reason we teach that there's no such thing as a human nature is because I see all the way through Paul's writings, particularly Paul's writings, that it's in the mind that we have the battle. It's in the mind where the contest is. The reason human beings say we have a human nature is that if we have a human nature, there's nothing you can do about it. That's the way you are. That's the way I was created. Can't do anything about it. That's the nature of that. Well, that's baloney. You can make any change you want to in your living in your mind. Because even if you say you have a human nature, it's dependent upon the way you think. And if you think the same old way all the time, then you have a concreted nature, we say. Not after you're born again. Once you're born again, you are partakers of God's nature, and that nature only flows through a mind that has made itself of no reputation. But now, before we look at the believer and the regard for the believer, let's take a close look at the person of Christ. If we take a good close look at the person of Christ, we're able to see what was necessary on his part to become identified with man. Now you have a fuzzy notion, as I always have, that all Jesus did was to leave heaven's ivory palaces and golden throne and come down to this old barren earth and die for humanity. We never thought much of the details of that. The actual thing was, he didn't just come down to this earth to die for humanity, but he came down to this earth to take humanity's place. To become identified with humanity, and in the end, for humanity and he to become as one, therefore becoming God's sons. By that one son. And so we see Christ coming to this earth in this, in this very... Uh, beautiful way. First, in the Virgin Mary, what was necessary for God the Son to take up residence in a human being? What was necessary? Is, is, is God who brings the great Son up every morning bigger than human? Is he greater than human? It's, it's to me like putting uh, an atomic bomb uh, inside of a thimble. It's, it's going to blow it all apart. And if you took God the Son and put him inside a human being like Mary, there would be the absolute necessity that he make some radical change in himself. And that's why I said in verse 7 here that he made himself think a certain way. He never became less than God. But he limited himself by this very term we call kenosis. He emptied himself in his thinking of everything that would hinder him from perfect identification with the human race. Now, you can be in church a long time, never hear anything about kenosis. I remember I came into these truths way back in the late 50s, and when I was at Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, uh, I wanted to talk about these things every once in a while, and I had a cohort there because there was a man there who had written a book on kenosis, and I think that little book might still be around the Gospel Publishing House or somewhere. And I was always thrilled that anybody saw that because I never in any of my other studies, in university or anywhere, ever heard anybody talk about kenosis. 
because we still kept up that fuzzy notion that God so loved the world that he just sent Jesus down here one day uh, to, uh, to, to be formed in the body of a little girl called Mary and he finally came out and grew up and he died for us so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. That's not the plan of God at all in its fullness. That's sort of an outer form of it. That's the shadow of it. But the real substance of what God was doing was that that Jesus would become identified with the human race in such a way that he would take on our sin and we would take on his righteousness. Now that's what's necessary in order for the plan of God to work and to function. And so it did take place like that. There, are, there were several things that were, were necessary to, to happen and to take place at that time. It was necessary for him to lay aside his glory. You, you may not be real interested in it, but uh, I want to get it in this session that there was from, uh, from the day Jesus came, different schools of thoughts about who he was. Just like I'm kind of talking and beating around the bush tonight with the idea that uh, do you really know anything about this Jesus who came to be identified with us and was put in us? Because if God the Son was put in us, it would explode us and blow us apart. So there was necessary that there be some limitation or kenosis on his part in order to be able to be identified with us. And he did do all of that. But there were, there were at least four controversies that had developed within two or three hundred years of the death of Jesus Christ. And uh, I, I want to get these on this tape particularly, while they may not be of great interest to you, but one of them was called Apollinarianism. Apollinarianism was a belief that uh, there was no human soul or mind in Christ. And then there was another controversy called Euchisiasm. Uh, E-U-T-Y-C-H-I-N. And this was where they said there was a fusion of two natures, that Jesus was, was uh, uh, two natures in one, and that uh, he was not all God when he came. He was, he was not all man. He was, as the scripture said, he's all God and all man. That's the way we've accepted it. But there was a controversy that said there was a fusion of two natures. There was mon monithelite. Uh, controversy, which declared that there was only one will, one doctor, the doctrine of just one will in Jesus of Nazareth. And then fourthly, there was Nestorianism, which was the doctrine of two natures in Christ. Now, these four controversies are what has been accepted or rejected one way or another by the Christian church. But you see, all four of these controversies, and I won't go into them because the, the main key to the scriptures is lacking in them, and that's the birthing. Not a one of them saw that it was God's obligation to birth in us another person who would be our life. Not like our life, but would be our life, our very life. And so it was necessary that, that God do something to, or Christ do something to himself in order that he might take on a human form. How could he live in Mary as Almighty God unless there had been this idea of kenosis? And so we have uh, several things that happen. Let's take a look at them. First thing is said here in the sixth verse of, of Philippians 2. It says, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What was the first thing that he did? He had to empty himself of equality with God. He emptied himself of the equality he had with God. Now, as Trinitarians, we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And neither of them, not any one of them, is less than the other. And not any one of them is the other. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. And so they are three separate and distinctive personalities of one God. And each one of them co-equal. The scripture said that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Therefore, he must empty himself of that equality with God in order to take on the form of a human being. 
Look with me to uh, John, the 14th chapter and the 28th verse. In John 14 and 28, You have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and if I go, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. What has he done? He has emptied himself of the equality that he had with God. How did he do that? With his very mind, he said, My Father is greater than I. Are you following me now? What is that spirit? What is that glorious spirit behind that? His mind has accepted the position that the Father is greater than he is. What will that do? That'll make it possible for him to be the father's seed and the father to place his own seed in a believing sinner because he has come from the father. He says that in another place. I come from the father. Like a seed comes out of the male father and goes in to the egg to create another person. Now then, he has limited himself or emptied himself of his equality. That's very important. But let's look at let's look at one more scripture on this lest we not get in the, the, the full picture of it. Turn with me if you will to uh, 1 Corinthians eleven. First Corinthians eleven and I think we want verse three. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Our famous authority scripture. But what does it say? It says that Christ has limited himself to be under God. You see? That understanding is necessary to get Christ identified with the human race. But that's not all. Let's move on. Christ emptied himself of his God form, or let's say God body. He emptied himself of it. The, the spirit body that he lived in before he came to this world and took on the body given to him by Mary, he had to empty himself of it. He had, I believe, willingly be led to leave that body. But let's, let's look at some scriptures that might help us there. In uh, Philippians, the third chapter, Philippians 3 and, uh, what is it, verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working wherewith he is able even to do all things unto himself. Notice something. The body that he has after the resurrection is a glorious body. So he limited himself of the glorious body in order to take up residence in a human body. See, that's kenosis. That's absolutely necessary for God to get Christ in a human being. Uh, Let's see if we can see another scripture that would uh, uh, help us here. Let's go to John, the first chapter. In uh, John, the first chapter, I believe I want verse 14. John 1 and 14, and the word, ah, that's the right scripture. And the word was made flesh. All right, what is this? This is kenosis. 
This is Christ emptying himself of the God spirit body. The word was made flesh that it may dwell in us and among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, how many times you've read that and heard that statement. The word was made flesh. That's kenosis. That's Christ on his part limiting himself. He had to take on a mind that I'm no longer that word that speaks worlds into existence. But I limit myself as the word to be able to take on flesh. Now this, this verse of scripture was one verse of scripture which stood against the, the powerful message that the believer has the power to speak the creative word. Not that we can't do it at times, and I don't mean to infer that, but in the word, of, uh, uh, in the uh, word of faith message, there was a strong idea that we speak creative words, that we have Christ in us and we speak into creation by that Christ that's in us. No, he limited himself to take on human form. The word was made flesh. That's kenosis. That's, that's something that was fixed in his mind. Well, now, let's pause for just a moment before we go any further to remind you of something. The Christ that's in you is the only son that God has. If in all his blazing glory as a God he operated through you, you would become as a God. But he doesn't do it that way. He takes on your flesh to operate through you as you are. Now I want you to get feeling for that. I want you to understand how Jesus came into you. He didn't come into you to be God or to make you God. He came into you limited by your flesh to operate through you and bring forth God's purpose for your life. This is why I'm so often saying that Christ in you is the only hope you have to reach your own creation, what God created you to be. Well now, the Word was made flesh so that he may dwell in men. But let's go a little further now. He limited himself to the immortality of body. And I've always had one little saying for that. You can't kill a God. You can't kill a God. So it was necessary that Jesus limit himself to the immortality of body. His spirit never changed. He was God in spirit all the way. But in body, it was necessary that he enter a kenosis that that body might be killed. That was God's plan. You see, he was to bear in that body all our sins and transgressions, our sicknesses, our diseases. He was to bear them. Just like you would uh, whip an animal, he had stripes laid upon his back for the healing of the nations because sickness and disease had been poured into his body. Go with me to 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15 and 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It was necessary that Christ absolutely fulfill the scriptures. How did he do that? He limited the God body to being immortal so that when our sin and shame went into his body, it would kill him, but that would also be the end of our sin. That would be the end of the sin that separated human beings from God. So that John could write finally in his epistle, he that is birthed of God cannot commit sin. Why? Christ has taken the sin of the human race and borne it in his body. Therefore he entered a kenosis, a limitation, in order that they could kill him. 
Now you heard uh, uh, things take place at that time, like uh, uh, you can't kill me, I'll lay my own life down. I could call legions of angels to come and take care of me here, but I don't do it because you're not taking my life, I'm giving it. Yeah. See, that's kenosis. That's him limiting himself in order that he might fulfill the plan of God to be identified with you and I, identification with you and I. So, so uh, he, he emptied himself of immortality of the body. Let's go over to 1 Peter, 1st uh, the second chapter, 1st Peter the second chapter. At the uh, 24th verse, I believe. 1 Peter 2 and 24 reads, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes we're healed. Now see the wording in that? His own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness. Who did this? He did this. He willingly accepted a position technically called kenosis, emptied himself, changed his thinking from being almighty God into whom Un, uh, by whom the worlds were spoken into existence. Colossians says all things created by him and for him and aside from him nothing is in existence. That almighty God the Son has limited himself to bear in his body our sins and to become mortal and die as a result of it. Now, this is how I'm on the progress here of showing you how you get Christ in you and what Christ is in you. But let's move on a little further over to 1 Peter 3 and, and 18, 18th verse, I believe it is. Just, just cross the page there. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just to the unjust, for, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, by the Spirit. Uh, verse 19 follows. We seldom ever quote verse 19, but that's a good verse. It says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, uh, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved, and so forth. Uh, what, he's, what he's really getting at here in this, uh, in this 19th verse is uh, he was able to go preach to those uh, that had come out of the Old Testament and set them free, uh, which he did. And they, too, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ just like we have. They were, as it were, prisoners. But the fact still remains that he bore in his flesh our sins and our transgressions. But let's look on a little further here now if we can. The glory which he had with the Father before the world had to be laid aside. Now, I'm coming upon something you probably never thought about in Jesus of Nazareth because you think he's all God. He was all God in spirit, but in his soulish part he had laid aside his godliness, not in total, but has laid it aside in order that he might be identified with you and I. And so he laid aside the glory, the scripture said, that was his with the Father. Go to John 12. John 12 and, uh, and uh, verse uh, 23. This is in that uh, uh, blessed portion of scripture that we call the five spiritual laws, which we're... Uh, we talk about an institute from time to time. Verse 23 reads, John 12 and 23 reads, And Jesus answered them and saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, 
the glory which was his before the world is laid aside. How do we know that? Because one of the most strategic things Jesus ever said is in this 23rd verse. Did you catch it? He said the hour is to come. A special time is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Well, now we don't want to make a big play on words between Son of God and Son of Man here because uh, most uh, uh, scholars wouldn't do that, I don't think. But notice he says that the Son of Man is about to be glorified. What is he speaking of? He's speaking of his death. So he says strategically an hour, a certain hour has come whereby I'm going to be glorified for what it is I came on this earth to do. So what is he saying by that? I'm laying aside my glory. The hour has come that I lay aside my glory. They're going to be able to kill me now. They couldn't kill me before this. See, they tried about three times before that, and each time he escaped them. Uh, they wasn't able to kill him. We say, oh, the Spirit led him. No, you couldn't have killed him before he laid aside his glory in this verse 23. So he said, the hour is come now that the Son of Man is going to enter into what it is God has planned for him to do and to become a part of. So his kenosis takes on living form here on Palm Sunday in the 12th chapter of John by those words, the hour is come. And I think uh, to close out this session here, and we're going to pick this subject up in the next session, I want to talk about the fact that the hour has come because just as it was with Christ, so is it with you and I. There is a certain time element whereby we take on the real living Christ as our life. We take him on in his death, burial, and resurrection by identification. And then we take him on by the final sense wrought by the Holy Spirit where Christ is revealed in us. There is a time for that. That time is a time chartered only by the Holy Spirit. Only by the Holy Spirit do we come to that specific time for the real Jesus to become our life. Now, I said that in such a way that might uh, you probably think, well, as others got an unreal Jesus. No, but the real Christ who comes into you, takes over in you, and fulfills you comes at a specific, a specific time. You see, that's the most ominous thing that happens to human beings. That's why Robbie and I keep coming back to places because every session I feel like somebody's coming a little closer to that time element, to that moment where even as Jesus said, the hour has come. I look at many of you sitting in this room, and I can see that that hour came for you at a certain time. It comes to you in very strange places, some driving down the street, some uh, even in a, in a bathroom, uh, some uh, uh, over a long period of time. It comes gradually. But a certain hour comes where the Son of Man is glorified by you. Jesus of Nazareth said, the hour is come. What provoked him to that hour was the two Greeks who had come saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Jesus said, They've come all the way to see me because I raised Lazarus from the dead, we suppose. And they wanted to see one who could raise one from the dead, but they had never yet seen the Messiah. They hadn't seen Christ who was Savior. And that provoked Christ to where he said, Well, they're going to have to see the Savior. <coughs> not the death defier, not the one who raises the dead, but the hour has come that the Son of Man is truly glorified, not by raising the dead, <coughs> but glorified by becoming what God intended that he be. Now that hour has got to come to every believer who goes on with God. It will come to every believer who goes on with God. There will be an hour. There will be a time that you know this time has come. This time has come for me where God will fit me into his eternal plan as he intended with the knowledge that Christ lives in me. I think you'll be able to put your finger on that time. I think that's too big a knowledge to say I just evolved into it. People come to me and say, well, I've always known that, baloney. Crude, but baloney. I think once you get a hold of this idea that Christ, the living Christ, is in me, that's a big thought that you've accepted into your soul, your mind, 
And that's bigger than any thought you ever had in your life. And I think you know the moment you did it. Now, I think the working out of that thought may come gradually and over a period of time. But I think you know the moment that hits you. Where you could say with Jesus in this regard, the hour is come. The hour is come. Well, that time has come for you here in this place. And that's why we keep coming back here is because we know that's more important than 10,000 people hearing the gospel. There are others that can do that. Plenty of preachers who can preach to great crowds and fill up auditoriums. But the message God has given to us is a message that brings you to that hour where you say, I realize now that the living Christ is in me. That's bigger than anything. That's the most earth-shattering thing there is. And that's why Paul said in Galatians 1, no man can teach you this Christ. And actually the Christ I'm talking about in this session that has to do with kenosis is a Christ that I can't teach you. I can just talk about it. But I'm talking about things that if you ever get a hold of them, you'll get better understanding. This word is filled with the understanding of how Jesus can come and identify and take up residence in you. Poor as you are, weak as you are, sinful as you are, ungodly as you are, unmeritful as you are, unclean as you are. How Jesus can come and identify with you is because of his kenosis, let alone your kenosis. But we're talking about his kenosis that made him possible for him to come and be identified with you and I. We're going to pick up on this same subject next session. We'll stop right here.